Uh, first of all, sorry to everyone, including those watching at home and those that might be watching later uh, about the delay, something that we needed to sort out. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, if those of you who are at home watching us, uh, I hope you find it informative. Uh, and housekeeping rules, uh, as far as I know, there's no uh, fire alarm test this morning, so if it goes off, it's real and we need to leave in an orderly manner. I think by now those present know where the exits and toilets are, so I'll not go through that. Uh, and what we will do for the benefit of the general public, uh, and I think so possibly some officers who may not have met the members, uh, will go through uh, those people who are here this morning. Uh, after this, I've got one or two things to explain about the paperwork we've got in front of us. I hope I get it right. If I don't, I'm sure somebody will correct me. So, my name is Councillor McRooney. I'm co-chair of this meeting. No particular reason. I'm going to go to my right. Thank you, Chair. I'm Councillor Dawn Dale, Councillor for Shy Green and Brightside, also co-chair for this meeting. Uh, Councillor Colin Ross, I'm member for Doran Totley and Lib Dem spokesman on this committee. Councillor Anne Whitaker for West Ecclesfield Ward. It's Councillor Brian Humshaw, um, a member for uh, Broomhill and Sharavale, uh, and I am deputy chair on this committee. Councillor Peter Garbutt for Netheredge and Sharon. Andrew Jones, I'm the Director of Chum Services in the Council. Sarah Bennett, Assistant Director of Legal and Governance. And I'm Paul Robinson, Committee Secretary. And our camera off. There are, there are a number of officers sat at the back who will introduce themselves as and when it's their appearance time, okay? Uh, right, I'm going to try and explain what's going on. Uh, thank you. Before we move on to the agenda, I've got a point of order. It's in connection with the agenda. So this is uh, in connection um, with an item that's missing from the agenda. So last year, the council put through an opportunities register. This is a mechanism for identifying forward funding for each department. This is agreed by the council uh, in June. Uh, 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 sorry, this is agreed by the committee here in June. And I've consistently asked for this to be added to the committee agenda. So I'm asking again, where is this on the order paper? Uh, because then we'll be able to scrutinise uh, this fundraising potential. Uh, so why isn't it on the agenda? And secondly, have Officer Time actually been put aside to consider this and put it in place? Andrew, I believe you're going to answer uh, Councillor Holmshaw's question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so yes, Councillor Holmshaw um, has raised this at least twice uh, in the committee and I can only apologise that we haven't yet um, initiated a piece of work around that nor brought that uh, to the committee. Um, so if the minutes can uh, be amended so in order to actually we'll take it away as an activity of the Children's Services Leadership Team, we'll bring it to uh, the committee's leadership briefing meetings and then we'll bring it back to a subsequent committee meeting in the future. Myself and Mark Shaker as our Head of Business Strategy will take that away as an action chair. Could, could I ask that that be the next committee meeting? You can. Can you do that? We'll make every endeavour, yes. And at the very least, we can bring an update to the next committee meeting, Chair, yeah. Happy with that, Councillor? Thank you. Right. Now, uh, paperwork. Uh, you will see that we are item five we have got minutes of the previous meeting. Those of you with eagle eyes will have noticed that they're actually the wrong minutes, uh, so we can't take them. They're wrong and incomplete minutes, so the, the next meeting that we have, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll have the 
minutes of that, the, the last meeting, and the minutes of this one today. Um, unfortunately, that's a result of uh, illness. I know it's normally Fiona, isn't it, that, that, that does them. I can, I can see she's not here this morning, so I can only assume that she's still unwell. I hope that she get, has a uh, speedy recovery. Uh, the work program, which is item seven, was, again, the wrong work program. That has been replaced and hopefully in, you will have found it on your desk when you walked into either your office or uh, this room this morning. Has everybody got that? Yep. And again, item eight, uh, is, no, apologies. I think it's item nine and 10 uh, were the ones that on my agenda say to follow, have eventually followed uh, but unfortunately, again, rather late, and again, they should be uh, in your pack that you found this morning on your desk. Is that correct? Has everybody got those before I start? I want to make sure everybody's got the paperwork in front of them before we start the meeting. Yeah, I'm getting nods. Apologies to everybody concerned, but unfortunately, again, that's down to... Uh, basically a shortage of staff, as I understand it, uh, illness. COVID isn't on the uh, telly very much these days, but it doesn't mean it's gone away. Um, have I got that right, Paul? You have. Thank you very much. That's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> right. Uh, we've done housekeeping. I've sorted the paperwork out. Now we've got apologies for absence and anybody that might be substituting. Chair, I've not been given any details of apologies. Dawn? Uh, yes, Chair. Councillor Mary Lee and Councillor um, Anne Murphy both submitted their apologies um, last week. And Councillor Gail Smith as well. Any others? I'm taking from the rather sparse attendance that there's not got any substitutes. No? Okay. Uh, exclusion of press and public, uh, no reason to do that, and I don't think we've got any members of the public here. Looking upstairs, no, unless they're hiding under the benches, no. Uh, declarations of interest, please. Don't appear to be any, thank you very much. Uh, minutes, I've just explained what's happened to those. Uh, Number six, public questions and petitions. Oh, that there was someone here to ask. Um, so we're not, we haven't got any of those. And now we're on to the work program item seven. Not sure who's going to speak to that, but that's where we are. I get that pleasure today, Chair. Thank you. So, um, yes, we, uh, thank you, Chair, and apologies to the committee that um, the, the final version of this was provided to you late. Um, so the committee's work programme is uh, set out at Appendix 1. Um, that also includes the addition and amendments since last time that you met. Um, those are set out at the, the first part of Appendix 1. Um, so the work programme is presented to you for your agreement. Um, and we also ask that you consider whether any further additions or adjustments uh, to the work programme uh, are required um, and also whether there are um, any items that you wish to be ex uh, explored by officers for uh, inclusion in the work programme report um, as potential additions to the work programme. Well, I can think of one. Councillor Holmshaw, I think you've mentioned that earlier, haven't you? So that needs to be go on it. Um, just in general terms, has anybody got any comments or suggestions on this item? No, it doesn't appear. I think it, all, all that needs to be said is that we're trying to cover everything that we think is important. And if need be, we will shuffle that around to accommodate what may or we may or may not be aware of at this moment in time. So it's a movable fleece. 
moving swiftly on. Item eight, secondary places planning, area five. Who's got the pleasure of introducing that? Joe. Just tell everybody who you are, Joe, and, and the fact that we've got Sam Martin down. I'm assuming there's a reason he's not here, and I'm sure you'll tell us why that is. Thank you. Yes, um, Joe Horobin, Director of Integrated Commissioning, um, and Sam is uh, a member of my management team. Uh, in the interest of um, managing a number of staff absences uh, and work plan challenges, uh, I've said that I will, I will update on, on his behalf. Um, and ordinarily, we would, I would encourage the writer of the report, Cathy Tandy, who is our absolute expert on places planning to, to come present this, but she actually is also very, is quite unwell, so wish her a speedy recovery. So without further ado, I will, I will uh, talk through the paper. Um, one moment, while I adjust my papers, so they're in the right order. Sorry, too many papers uh, in one place, right. So the recommendation um, to the committee is um, with regards to our proposal to expand the number of uh, secondary school places in the city in planning area five, which is in the east of the city. Um, this is um, in order to ensure that we are able as a local authority to meet our statutory duty and ensure there are sufficient secondary places uh, available to meet the demand in 2023-24, so next school year. Um, we have a statutory duty under section, seven, uh, section 14 of the Education Act 1996 um, to provide sufficient school places for all pupils within our area. Now, there are seven planning areas in the city in Sheffield, and uh, planning area five is in the east of the city. Um, and this is the area where we have uh, forecast to see a deficit in secondary places next, uh, next school year, next academic year, as a result of new housing and also population growth and movement within the city. Following the national picture, additionally, births in Sheffield have increased, uh, increased by 25% between 2002 and 2012. And that larger birth cohort has been moving its way through the school system from early years um, through primary and is now in the secondary sector. Um, and next year will be the, the peak of that bulge into, into secondary schools. Um, we therefore have been working with primary schools and secondary schools across the city to accommodate this bulge, which will be temporary, albeit we do expect um, a further uh, bulge uh, um, in, a, in a couple of years' time. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we expand sensibly and appropriately in the right areas of the city to avoid children having to travel um, outside of their catchment. Uh, and in such a way as not to leave us with a, um, with a um, surplus in future years, which might make any school less sustainable. So um, within uh, the uh, planning area five, we have a deficit of 75 to 90 secondary school places, and that equates to two and a half or three forms of entry um, in that area. And we expect actually that that will remain quite high um, until that peak in 27, 28 that I mentioned. Um, the deficits in planning area five have to be addressed in order for us to meet our statutory duty for the city as a whole. Um, and, and addressing them in planning area five enables catchment children in that area to access a school in their local area. So capital delivery service have undertaken desktop service of surveys of three schools in that planning area to assess the potential capacity. So this is an initial assessment of what the opportunities are. There is a fourth school, but that was excluded because its catchment is citywide as a faith school. Um, we've had meetings with the three remaining schools um, earlier this year, and all schools agreed to work with us on addressing the deficit places. 
um, and so we've gone on to do further capacity assessments. That has ruled out um, one of the three um, places, one of the three schools, that's Oasis Academy in Don Valley, just because there is insufficient internal and very limited external capacity to expand. And obviously there are you know, rules and regulations which protect the size and scale and, and scope of expansions and you know, the number of children in any one space. So um, the remaining two schools that we have been working with are Sheffield Park and Sheffield Springs Academies who do have external space and could accommodate between them those maximum three forms. Um, there's a really detailed um, options analysis um, in this paper and um, there are a number of ways in which we can manage the expansion. Uh, I'm not planning to go into huge detail because partly because further work is needed to work with those schools uh, and to ensure that we reach a, an agreement that works for the schools, that works for children and families in the area, um, and yeah, which we are enabled to able to enact from 20, uh, September 23. So um, the um, equalities impact of this um, is important to note, just because this is an area where um, they where we have particular uh, high levels of deprivation and a higher proportion of black and minoritized ethnic communities. Um, and um, they both, the schools serve um, an area of disadvantage above the national average. So it is really important that we manage this well and that we work with the schools to make this um, a, a, a valuable offer. Um, we, in terms of the finance implications, we have got our details of basic need funding allocation um, from central government um, up to 24, 25, and um, we believe that we can undertake the proposed expansions within the budget um, allocated. Um, so, um, rather than go through lots of detail on the options appraisal uh, to date, uh, I'll just take us back to, um, to the recommendation for this committee, which is that uh, we agree that the committee is, uh, agrees the proposed secondary school expansion plans um, in order for us to proceed with the negotiations with the school and the further you know, investigations of the site that will be needed. Um, and there is a process in terms of, um, for example, procuring um, suitable porter cabins, etc., which would need to be followed. So hence the time pressure for this to come to this committee because we really need to proceed at, at pace. Happy to take any questions, thank you. Thank you, Joe. I should have said you're just back from a, uh, a period of illness yourself, aren't you? So uh, welcome back and I'm um, glad you're recovering. I'll take questions. Colin first. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm supporting the, the proposal. Clearly, it's very important that we um, accommodate all our children as close as possible to their catchment areas. Just my concern is that we put a solution that's sustainable for more than just a single year. If we've got a bulge of up to um, three forms, and this proposal is for, for three forms, whether in the subsequent years there is room for, because you talked about a bulge lasting two years, whether there's sufficient room and we provide a solution that you know, will be six extra forms in the uh, across the two, two schools. I just want reassurance that we we're planning ahead and we're not having to come back to committee next year with a further mobile going on one of the sites. Thank you. Um, that's um, that's a, a, a very uh, pertinent question. And I can reassure you that our forecasting is, um, is um, short, medium and long term. We're constantly checking whether our projections are aligning with what actually manifests month by month, year on year. And we have a really high degree of, of accuracy, slightly above average in terms of our accuracy of forecasting. So we are confident that this is the right solution, the appropriate solution that will see us through the, the period of time up to the end of the, the second peak in this particular area of the city. Um, 
you know, there, there is always the potential for fluctuations in, in where people choose to live and who chooses to live where. Um, however, we, we work really closely with housing and planning, etc., in order to try and anticipate um, where we might have changes in the, in the population needs that might require more or less housing. Uh, so yes, I think we can, I can provide you with that assurance. And if you would like to see um, you know, some more detail on the forecasting and the way we do that, we will be bringing that back to committee in terms of how we do our sufficiency planning for the whole city across all types of school provision. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just conscious that actually in and it will impact on part of the area there are in the, the, the new plan that's expansion in around attic left of quite substantial housing and that yeah. needs to be factored in long term as, as well. Peter. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm an ex-teacher, so I've done my share of teaching in, um, in Quarter Covent. Uh, it's less than ideal. Uh, and indeed, the learning take, that takes place in Porter Cabins is less, in my opinion, than the learning that takes place in, in schools. Uh, so is there any plan to uh, move from Porter Cabins as, as a, an emergency, um, as it were, uh, measure to making these more permanent um, classrooms so that children can learn in optimum circumstances? Thank you. Um, another really good question, and having been taught in a really cold port cabin many years ago, um, I, 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 uh, I understand what you're, what you're saying here. Um, the, the, the challenge that we have to balance up is, um, is the fact that this is a relatively short-term bulge, and after this we expect, um, based on all demographic information, um, that we will see a decline in demand for secondary school places. So what we have to balance up is, the, um, is, the, is ensuring that we have sufficient provision, but that we don't end up with oversupply that causes pro further problems for schools further down the line. I would say as well that in terms of port cabins are part of a solution, and we will, that's part of our next level of investigation is whether we um, what, what ways we can accommodate those extra three forms uh, within schools and, you know, to what degree we need um, additional capacity to be brought in. Um, and I think, you know, the quality of, the, of that port cabin is something I can, I'm happy to provide some more information on in terms of, you know, the kind of specification that we would be going out for because absolutely it cannot be a lower quality experience for uh, children and young people, or their hard-working teachers. I think you want to come in, Andrew. Uh, yes, Chair, just, I don't want to be pedantic, but I just want to be clear. Porter Cabin actually is a brand uh, of uh, temporary buildings, and I don't think the council is seeking to, uh, um, to have any negative reflections about that particular company and its provision of its of, of its uh, buildings in the city or in other places, um, and I do obviously in recent school experience I do accept Peter Gar uh, Council of Garbutt's uh, point about former temporary buildings not always being of a high quality, but I, know, I do know that actually temporary buildings now that are used in schools are of a very different calibre and order. But I just wanted to make that point in particular about Port Cabin. You got enough reassurance there, Pete? Uh, yes, although um, I would very much like to uh, uh, visit one of these up-to-date porter cabins to uh, to have a look to see how, how good it is, because um, the ones I've taught in weren't good at all. Can I just put in the ones at our local primary school are probably better than some of the classrooms with their own um, toilet facilities built into them and read nice and, and cosy, so reassure you with that one. You're not on commission, Cole. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's very gentlemanly of you, Dawn. 
Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, some of my questions might have been answered, but I do question the um, the length of time that we're going to need these. Knowing Manor Castle Road and Darnold Tinsley Road very well, the fact that some of the local primary schools are currently having to have extra classrooms built on um, it means to me and Darnold Tinsley and all the building and the new homes that are family homes that are being built in those areas, I foresee that the bulge will go on for a lot longer than that because there's going to be new people moving in and new families, being new babies being born um, for, for decades to come. So I do worry about the lifespan of a mobile um, again, having been taught in one in the 1980s that were temporary um, and, and kind of went on in quite a while. Um, I, I, I do, I think I'd like more information around the, the, the adding up and the, how we've come to the fact that we think it's just a temporary measure when actually, as Councillor Ross said, the uh, plans for these communities are, are quite big. Thank you. Um, yes, in an ideal world, we would have brought, um, we would have brought these uh, these uh, papers and reports in the opposite, in a different order. Uh, we will be bringing our uh, sufficiency planning um, approach and the detail of how that works, the forecast, the work we do with uh, planning, housing, etc., um, to a committee in the new year. Um, unfortunately, because of the time pressure on on this particular um, planning area, um, we have needed to bring this before we've brought the overarching sort of context and strategy for how we how we come to these these conclusions. Um, but I am very happy to share with with you in the meantime um, and take you through that. We will bring that report through um, early in the new year. So ap apologies that I'm, that things have come that way round. It's just. Uh, time pressures and pressures on the committee. Are you happy with that, Bill? Yeah. Brian? Yeah, so uh, two questions, one leading on from the other, uh, partly at least. So we're talking about uh, a planning area five, which is in the eastern city, which some of us will know where that is, but mem members of the public will not necessarily know where that is. So I think for transparency here, we should explain what that covers, but also, you know, to put that in the report as well, so that people know precisely where that area is. So that's not the first point. Uh, second point is um, we we are exploring with a neighbouring authority uh, a spe uh, developing a, a joint bid for a specialist school. Uh, so, what is the potential in, in some of our other planning areas? for working with neighbouring authorities. Now, I know we want to keep this within catchment, but maybe if you have a neighbouring authority that, that has a development on one side of that boundary, but also we have a need for specialist or for, main, uh, for, for uh, mainstream schools. So, you know, can we be talking to, you know, those, those neighbouring authorities and trying to work up plans for that? What's the potential there? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, that's a, a, another good uh, question and yes, I agree, it would be useful to uh, provide, perhaps with them we could do that within the minutes of this meeting, but to provide a map of each of the planning areas. Again, that's, you know, um, that's something that we'll go into a lot more detail on we'll bring it, but it'll, I think that's a fair challenge. Um, so if it's okay with the committee, um, I'd, I'd like to be able to circulate that and put that within the minutes. Yeah, could you also, uh, with little dots, put which schools are in there as well and identify secondary and primary, etc., please? Absolutely, yes. So we will have, yeah, we'll, we'll identify all, all of the education provision across across the city, um, prim uh, well, primary, secondary, um, post-16, um, special and um, and uh, uh, and um, and school. So we will we will do that, and we can also provide a map of early years provision as well. I suggest we might need to provide them on separate maps, otherwise it becomes a little bit difficult to read. But yes, absolutely. Um, the um, second point uh, that uh, you raised, um, Councillor Hamshaw, 
with regards to neighbouring authorities, I should have said actually that as well as working with the schools in locality five, we do look at all the adjacent locality planning, the planning areas um, to explore, you know, um, and ensure that we've got backup options, if you like, um, should we should we need them so we do do that and um, where there are opportunities with neighboring authorities we do have those links with with colleagues you know working in those authorities and we will explore those possibilities however um, we need to bear in mind that actually our duty is to provide within our local authority area and therefore you know um, we it's important that we work with our planning areas within the city um, that said, you know, where there are opportunities, we would not not explore the potential for that. Um, could I suggest then that, I mean, we are going to have um, the, the, the big picture plan come to this uh, committee, I think you said in the new year. Before that, it will obviously go as a general discussion to the, the entire committee sort of off camera, as it were. Um, can I suggest that you put that, if it's not already in, the idea of cross-border cooperation in terms of school planning onto that discussion? I mean, the, the incident one, and it's probably a, a complete nonsense, but Tinsley uh, seems to me to be p a potential for that because uh, it's close to the Rotherham border and the communities are very similar in, in makeup. So. I just, it's just a thought, and it may be a complete and utter non-starter, but it might, it might, it's worth ruling it out, if nothing else, I think. Yeah? So could we have a, a look at that? Are you okay with that, then, Brian? Uh, yes, I'm fine with that. I mean, there, there are, you know, you brought one example up, you know, I was thinking about North East Derbyshire, uh, Derbyshire County Council, uh, and, and the Waverley area in Rotherham as well. So if we're, if we're looking at actual examples, uh, even if it's only to rule it out, I think it's worth having a look at. It's just a comment, really. We're talking in terms of temporary buildings uh, to house additional children. Um, one of the things I'd be interested to know is the children that are actually going to be in those buildings, do they feel part of the school? Because my experience of children being in temporary buildings, they did not feel connected with the main school. They felt like they were sort of somehow different. And I know we've talked in terms of that the education that they would receive would, would be identical and that temporary buildings, you know, now can be wonderful. But do we actually know that those children feel part of the school? Because I think, you know, we, we, the sense of belonging that children have for school and need for school is really, really important. And I don't think we should overlook that. Thank you. Um, another another really really good point, and that I think um, is what part of the conversations that we have with with schools when we're having these discussions um, is you know how will this be how will the additional capacity be integrated within the school so that it's not a separate experience so that you know children are not um, sort of segregated from the sort of the, the rest of the school um, um, and. And actually, uh, in terms of secondary, we would anticipate that, that children will need to move seamlessly between the buildings in order for their full curriculum requirements to be, to be met. So, um, you know, that, that is something that we will discuss with, with schools um, quite explicitly. But thank you very much, and I'll, I will feed that back to my team as a, as a key note of importance. Is uh, anybody else before I ask a couple of questions myself? No. Um, well, one's a comment. The Oasis down uh, Olympic Legacy, Legacy Park. I found it a bit disappointing that they hadn't built it in such a way to allow expansion, at least on the outside. You know, it, it seems rather odd to build a brand new school, which is there to be popular, uh, and not allow for potential expansion. So that's disappointing and a little surprising. Uh, the other is the budget that we've got. I mean, I don't know what you get these days in terms of education building costs for 5.5 million. Um, so, uh, it, 
the question is really, given the rate of inflation that we've got at the moment, and you know, if you go and buy a bag of potatoes, you know what we're talking about. Um, is that enough? Or is there an inbuilt contingency in that to allow for inflationary pressures? Because I don't want it to all go horribly wrong simply because uh, we haven't built, a, we haven't factored in potential rising costs. Thank you. Um, with regards to Oasis, that was before my <laughs> before my time in post, but I'm, I can I can take that. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just yeah. making an observation. And and I'm not, you know, uh, I'm, I'm what I'm, I suppose saying is I can I can go back and, and explore my thinking on that, um, and you know I'm happy to come back with a bit of a, a rationale for that if if there is one to give. Um, uh, the um, the second point about whether the 5.5 million is sufficient, uh, we believe that it is, and that will include some degree of contingency. Uh, that said, we are in uh, strange and uh, unpredictable uh, times, and um, but we would expect that that that, that this will be sufficient, and uh, we expect that future um, grants in this space will will need to match the increasing costs of capital development. Right. Uh, any final questions before I do the next bit? No? No. Okay. So now I'm supposed to read out the recommendations. Is that right, Paul? Um, you, it's on this bit of... They're not very long, so I'll, I'll read them out. It says, agrees the proposed secondary school expansion plans and planning area five. This will enable the local authority to fulfill its statutory duty and ensure sufficient secondary places are available to meet the forecast demand in 23-24 and agrees for up to 5.5 million of the remaining balance of basic need funding to be utilized to fund the proposed expansion. Is there any dissent? No, so I assume that that's okay. Right, thank you very much to everybody. And now, supported accommodation provision, which was one of the papers that unfortunately arrived late. And um, whoever's doing that, could you take your, your place, please? <laughs> I just feel a bit like mastermind this. <laughs> and your chosen specialist subject is. <laughs> right, when you're ready, Victoria, please. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. I'm Victoria Gibbs. I'm the head of Children's Commissioning. Um, so, apologies uh, in terms of the late receipt of the report. Um, the report seeks approval to commission an extension to the current supported uh, accommodation dynamic purchasing system for young people who are aged 16 to 25 years for looked after children and care leavers. The period of the requested extension is for a further 18 months uh, to take us through to uh, September 2023. The current arrangement ends on the 1st of April 23. The estimated value of the proposed extension is uh, 8.4 million. It is important to note that in terms of the uh, value, uh, that's based on current projections in relation to the numbers of young people and care leavers, our current projections, um, and also it will take uh, into account any uh, potential increase in our uh, unaccompanied asylum-seeking children and young people as well. It's also important to note that um, this uh, contract or the dynamic purchasing system, um, the value of the contract or the arrangement can go up or down um, because it's in relation to specific numbers of young people who require um, semi-independent uh, support and accommodation. The current framework has been in place since 2019 and there are 26 approved providers across three lots. So that takes into account uh, young people who have more of a complexity uh, of need, so group living, um, group living for uh, young people who have more moderate needs and also supported tenancies in the community with floating support. Um, at any one time, uh, on average, um, 
we have 113 people who are supported um, in this type of uh, accommodation. In terms of uh, this particular uh, commissioned arrangement, this supports our statutory duty in relation to our children in care and our care leavers to ensure that we have um, a good spread of accessible high quality accommodation uh, and support for their transition into adulthood in line with the Children Act and our care leave and statutory duties. The pur purpose of, of the supported accommodation ensures that young people can be supported with appropriate accommodation, there is a level of support that is commensurate to their level of need. Um, the wider um, Outcomes are that we, of course, want to continue to promote contact with family, friends and communities where that's appropriate to do so, and that we continue to work in partnership with our independent and voluntary sector providers to raise the quality of support available to our young people and our care leavers. In terms of the proposal for the extension, uh, it's quite timely, as in uh, 2023, uh, the government is introducing new national standards for the registration, regulation and inspection of supported accommodation for looked after children aged 16 and 17 years and care leavers, which will be overseen by an Ofsted inspection uh, regime. Ofsted will begin to register uh, providers from April 23, ahead of the national standards becoming mandatory in autumn of next year and inspections commencing in uh, April 24. So in terms of the proposed extension, um, that enables us to ensure that that uh, is enshrined within the uh, contract uh, moving forwards. The new national standards are, will be based on four key areas, uh, which are leadership and management, child protection, accommodation uh, and support. Uh, the period of the extension will all also allow us to do uh, extensive stakeholder engagement in relation to the future commissioning of the dynamic purchasing system and to co-produce this uh, with young people and our care leavers. Um, we have already started to have some early discussions uh, and negotiations with our current providers in relation to their intent to register and be subject to Ofsted inspection um, in the future. So in terms of the equality implications, a full equality impact assessment will be undertaken uh, should the um, extension uh, be approved and agreed today. Uh, I think I've indicated the financial and commercial uh, implications as part of that. Um, and in relation to the legal implications, we have a duty to support uh, and accommodate looked after children and care leavers. Uh, in terms of the Children Leaving Care Act and the Care Leavers uh, Regulations 2010. Uh, there is a, a reasonable legal argument that the proposed modification, i.e. the extension, is justified in relation to the public contracts regulations, um, and this is not substantial. Um, so therefore, uh, we are asking the committee um, to approve the extension for a period of another 18 months to allow us to do a full recommissioning exercise that will be co-produced uh, with our children and young people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Now we'll take questions, and the first one is Dawn. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Victoria. Uh, while I fully support the, this offer, because this is something that uh, is really important that we get right, I actually support moving forward that there is more... Um, that Ofsted are going to be involved and in looking at the services provided. But what are we currently doing? You're asking us to look at recommissioning and extending for 18 months, but what are we currently doing about quality and value for money with regards to our current commission uh, and organisations that we're commissioning? I, I'm just mindful of that because later on we're coming onto our budget um, and I want to ensure that anyone on the framework is of the standard that we do expect. Um, I don't want to wait for 18 months for Ofsted to come and tell us that we've got providers that aren't. And am I right in thinking that any current provider who doesn't want to register will no longer be on the framework? Thank you for those personal questions. Yes, you're correct. In terms of moving forward, providers would not be able to be on the framework. Um, in terms of our quality standards, uh, then we do look at those very carefully. We want to ensure that there is high quality support and accommodation for our young people. Um, so certainly for 16 and 17 year olds, uh, they will have a care plan and also a pathway plan for our care leavers that's overseen by a social worker. 
uh, so 16 and 17 year olds who are in care will continue to have the independent reviewing officer. So again, they're in terms of the individual needs of the children and young people, they're reviewed regularly in relation to the review of the looked after children reviews, but also the pathway plan reviews and the visits by the young people social workers. There's a close relationship between children's services and commissioning in relation to sharing any key intelligence so that we're mindful of any um, uh, potential concerns and we act on them in a, in a diligent manner. We also undertake uh, spot checks on a regular basis. Uh, so we physically uh, visit uh, the premises and the accommodation um, and we also receive regular feedback from the social workers uh, and the leading care service as part of that quality. Um, but you're absolutely right in terms of moving forward. Uh, we're not complacent. We always want to increase um, our ability to be able to continue to have a good oversight um, as these are our children uh, and young people. Thank you. Um, I mean, that was a very comprehensive answer. And I, actually, I, I, I'm, I found it quite reassuring that we've got that level of uh, supervision as a contract. What I'd like to ask is that in, when we publish the minutes, that Victoria's answer, as far as possible, uh, is, is written in, in full. Uh, because I think if anybody reading that, they will get some reassurance that we, we do take the time to make sure that, uh, we're, that the young people are getting a proper service. Okay, Peter. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Victoria. Um, yes, uh, on page six, four, four, climate implications. There are no climate impl implications. Um, one of the areas that uh, falls within the contract is accommodation, um, and I'd suggest there are some climate um, implications there. Um, not only that, but uh, if the accommodation was um, uh, was to become climate friendly, it would actually uh, impact very positively on the costs of the provider as well, because there would be much lower costs for providing energy, etc. So, um, and I know that it's very difficult to um, to impose this on providers, uh, and uh, I was wondering if there was some way of um, having a, a means of um, getting a provider to think about it and maybe take some action on it uh, rather than imposing it as a, as a, um, a precondition. Um, so I think that's, that's one of my uh, concerns in this particular thing. Is, is the word you're after leverage, Peter? That's leverage. Thank you for that, Councillor Garber. I think that is a pertinent point. I think that's something we can look at within the recommissioning exercise in terms of how do we um, encourage our providers who lease the tenancies or who own the buildings to be able to be as environmentally friendly as, as they possibly can. So, thank you. Do you want to add that as a, another recommendation rather than it being minuted? Can we do that, Paul? can do that, I'm told. Do you want to do that? Yeah? Everybody happy with that? Okay. Um, I have... Anybody else has got any questions? I've just got a suggestion as well in terms of um, a, another recommendation, and it's on the back of what Dawn said about uh, the introduction of an inspection regime, which for many people, in many people's opinion, is long overdue. Um, so I just wondered if we could add another recommendation that, that we support the principle of the introduction of an inspection regime uh, without actually going and saying that we, um, we support the, um, the, the detail of it because it's unknown as far as I know yet. And there's always a possibility that you know, you, we might not particularly like certain aspects of it. But if we could put down a recommendation that says we agree the principle of introduction of a, an inspection regime, would members be happy to do that? Can I clarify, you meaning the Austin? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, with that, I'm not going to read out the, uh, the recommendations. The, I've got to ask if we can, is there an, any dissent? 
on the recommendations as per the report. If not, I'll take that as a yes, and you can go forward with that retort. Thank you. Many thanks. You're welcome. Who's next in the op chair? Oh, it's young Ryan. Another one of the two follow, isn't it? Um, and it should be item 10, which I'm told by Councillor Garvey is actually printed in the back of item 9, which was very helpful to somebody who couldn't find it this morning. Thank you. There you go. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Ryan Keyworth. I'm the Director of Finance and Commercial Services. Yeah, apologies for the late issue of this uh, of this short paper to update the committee on the, uh, the council's overall budget position. Um, that's the purpose of this paper, really. Um, the report to Strategy and Resources Committee uh, last month showed um, that basically about £60 million of savings and income generation opportunities had been identified across the organisation against a target of £80 million. Um, clearly significant work has been done, uh, but as the report says, there's still, still a little bit more to do. Um, work is in progress with, with members to firm up the proposals that we've already uh, received, that have already been made, that have already been noted by the policy committees during the month of September. And, and in particular, you know, the, the work of this committee, which did start later than, than others due to turnover in senior officer support. Um, the, the intention is to continue this month working with members to firm up the proposals already made and to report to the Strategy and Resources Committee on the 5th of December. Uh, that report, I hope, will detail the savings and income generation opportunities that the, the Council intends to take to, to, to seek to balance its budget as, as best it's able to at that point. There, there, is, there is the possibility, but not the certainty yet, of further Strategy and Resources meetings uh, during December to take additional proposals. What it does mean, though, is it's uh, very likely that savings relevant to this committee, in fact, it's inevitable that savings relevant to this committee might not return to this committee before going forward to strategy and resources. That's just a feature of timing. Um, unfortunately, the, the thing about budget timetables is they are, they are generally pretty fixed once, once, you, once you set them off. Um, Chair, that's all I really wanted to say by means of introduction to the short paper. Obviously, happy to take any questions on the paper or anything connected that members may have. Anybody? Colin. Uh, just to, to follow up your point, yeah, with, with timing, I think um, the, the figures for this particular committee are, are better than are published in the paper because there's been agreements this week to sign off for a number of the mitigations. So I believe, and it may come up in the subsequent paper, our mitigations to find are down to about 3.4 million, assuming all groups have agreed to the green proposals, which I believe they have, have now. Well, I think, I think Councillor, you're just demonstrating the moving feast nature, particularly of this committee's work, but actually it's not unique to this committee. Um, the snapshot you've got here is as it was three or four weeks ago, which particularly for this committee inevitably means it's out of date. So I'm, I'm grateful to the work that the committee and officers are doing actually to continue the, the, the very difficult task of trying to identify savings and income opportunities to, to, to bridge the gap, and I can see that's still going on. Peter? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ryan. Um, yes, it's, it's a question of accessibility, um, a, a jargon, um, uh, so that members of the public can understand which committee is which. Um, you've put them in... Um, AH, AHSC, ECF, TRC, we understand what they are, but I think the public may. So in future, if we have something like this, would it be possible to put them in full? Yeah, of course, apologies. I'm, I'm sometimes marking your own homework, as I'm sure you're familiar with, is, is really very difficult, and apologies for that, it's entirely on me. Is that it, Peter? Anybody else? No? Just a couple of, uh, well, I've got one question. Prior to uh, this paper coming here, where did it go before that, uh, Ryan? Is it just straight to us, or has it been somewhere else before? So this paper um, didn't go, I think this, well, this is the first policy committee of this round, so it hasn't been anywhere else before this. Um, this paper, sometimes supplemented by 
an appendix, depending on the state of each committee's budget process, will go to each committee this month. The other's a comment. Um, I mean, I, I'm not going to make a big deal about it right now, but the, comment, the, the idea that budget, um, budget proposals might bypass uh, a full meeting of the com this committee is something that I'm going to take up elsewhere. Um, doesn't sound right to me, but there may be a there may be a, a, a good reason why it's not going to happen. But it's not something that I feel comfortable to uh, to endorse right now. Okay, I'm just understood. letting you know. No, un understood, Chair. And, and the timetable was originally set out to avoid that. Uh, we are, to a certain extent, where we are. Um, constitutionally, actually, it's for the Strategy and Resources Committee to recommend a budget to full council, and as I know, um, some members will be aware. Um, the the idea by effectively involving policy committees at this at, to this extent was an attempt to to respect the new committee system and to give policy op policy committees the maximum possible opportunity to participate in the budget process in an open and public way. Um, it's, it's of course um, an option the committee has to to have a further meeting if, if you want to. don't know how we managed to squeeze that in, but it's something we could certainly look to try and arrange if that's something you'd prefer. I wouldn't disagree. I'm not going to have a debate over, you know, ping pong over the council chamber about that. But I wouldn't disagree with very much of what you've just said. But I, I am still uncomfortable about that as an idea. And we'll, for the time being, we'll just leave it at that. Okay. Uh, the recommendations, I believe, are to note the uh, contents of the uh, of the paper, which for anybody that's watching. Uh, means we neither agree nor disagree with what's in it. Um, it's a, well, it means no. Yeah, but that, yeah, you know, we know what it is, Colin, but it doesn't necessarily follow that anybody that's uh, listening or watching this uh, does. Um, so, uh, is there any dissent? No, then that's agreed. Okay. And item 11, I think that's you again, Ryan. It is, thank you, Chair. So this report presents the month six budget monitoring for the, the council overall and specifically for this committee. Um, month six, uh, overspent forecast of 18.6 million pounds, so a slight improvement on the previous month. Um, much of the, the monitoring report repeats uh, discussions that we've already had either at this committee or, or elsewhere, um, basically because it is a year-to-date report and some of the, or many of the reasons for the overspend remain the same. Um, as I've previously said to this committee, this committee's got one of the biggest budgets in the council and had one of the biggest budget challenges uh, to, to deliver in 22-23. Um, it's also had one of the biggest overspends for reasons that we've discussed previously here, but I'm obviously happy to talk about again. Um, a few points to note really this month and that the things that are different from the last time I, I spoke to you about it. Um, the position has improved for this committee uh, by about £900,000 from month five to six. Um, half a million pounds as a result of using household support funding uh, to support Section 17, which are effectively emergency payments. Uh, we've got a slightly lower staff cost forecast. That's in the context of quite a large staff base, so it's a relatively small percentage movement, but nonetheless a, a lower staff cost forecast. Um, slightly lower costs for unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. And also the expectation now that Aldine House will return to normal levels of financial performance, at least, uh, in the new year, which I think is a, is a good indicator for, for, the, for, the, for the new year um, that Aldine House is back on, on financial track and not, uh, not losing money anymore. So I'm, I'm really happy to take any questions that members have on the report. Um, thank you. Any questions? Not so far. I'm going to spoil it. <laughs> no, uh, it's, it's a relatively friendly question, right? Um, I'm just, I, I'm, I seem, well, I've got the, the, the thought in my head that a lot of attention is being paid to uh, how we deal with uh, setting next year's budget. But I'm not quite so clear about how much attention or how we are dealing as a committee system with the overspend for this year. 
Do you see what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that work isn't being done to it, but I'm not sure that we're perhaps being told as much about trying to get the overspend down as we are about trying to deal with next year's budget. Do you see what I mean? Is that a, a reasonable question? Or if you could just tell me how other committees or the committee system in total is dealing with this year's problem. I think it's a very fair question. Uh, we have spent a lot of time and, and energy on uh, basically nailing down next year's budget, both at this committee uh, and elsewhere. Um, Time and attention is certainly being given to managing this year's position, um, but I think it's, it's a fair comment that not as much time is taken up in, in committees like this. Um, perhaps not, 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 not so true when it, when it comes to, to the public, public meetings, but certainly uh, behind the scenes and in the private discussions that, that we have, um, most of those discussions I think are, are on next year's budget rather than managing this year's issues. The, the key thing for me is that the kind of issues that we see in this year's budget around challenges in recruiting and, and changing the way the workforce uh, operates and so on really need bottoming out for next year. And I'd really rather, if, if there is limited time, which of course there is and limited amount of people to work on this, that the real focus is on having a very early and robust start to next year's budget rather than um, trying to, to, to make up time or catch up on this year's budget at the expense of having a robust position for next year. When we set the budget for council in March, um, we had a very challenging savings target. Um, a significant amount of those savings uh, apply to this committee. Um, but what we also did is give ourselves a bit of financial time and space to, to do some of those things. Uh, and we were able to take a little bit of risk in the budget for this year. Some of those risks have, have happened. Um, the savings that we hoped would happen in respect to this committee in terms of um, actually expanding Aldine House provision, um, expanding children's homes provision in the city, hasn't, hasn't worked out the way we wanted it to. Um, so rather than trying to go over why that happened and is there anything we can do about it, because you know, why it happened is because the facts that we understood just over 12 months ago are different to the facts as we see them today. Is there anything we can do about it? No, not really. We can go around that as many times as we like. What I'd rather we spent our time on, though, is, is, is coming up and the conversations that I know are happening uh, with, with members on all, in all parties about the work of this committee is how we get a really robust and clear position for next year so that we are more certain about next year's budget uh, and that we've got a better chance of delivering it. Thanks, Ryan. Dawn? Thank you, Chair. I think mine's more of a comment for members of the public that may be watching. Whilst we talk about the budget and it is about the money and the numbers, I'd just like to reassure the public that any decisions that are being made by this committee are being done with children's safety at the forefront. And, you know, it is important that people do know that. And we want to ensure that our children, young people and families remain safe. We cannot predict what's going to be coming next year. So we are working within the bounds of the budget. But there is a cost of living crisis and so when we talk about overspend we will ensure that our children are safe and we will not turn children away simply because we are not within a budget so i just wanted to make that clear that all of the members in this room when we sit and discuss our budget we always question the implement implications and the safety of our children and i think sometimes when we talk about budget that doesn't come across but members and officers of this council that is our absolute uh, mission can I just second Dawn's in the comments and welcome them about um, the forefront is actually keeping all our children safe and secure? Absolutely. Um, any other questions to Ryan? No. Uh, recommendations again are to note the financial position of the council uh, as of month six. Is there any dissent on that? We can't really because it is what it is, isn't it? You know. <laughs> Uh, right, that's that passed, and we're on to the next item, which is 12, number 12, Early Years School Readiness Review. And the next contestant is... I'm 
version of Greedy Game of Strategic Commission Manager for Early Years and Early Help. Uh, and today I'd like to talk to you about our Early Years School Readiness Review. Um, the purpose of bringing this here today is to give you an update on, where, on the findings and the actions that we've already taken and to ask you to support uh, a number of areas that we want to take forward. There's a strong evidence base that children's experiences during their early years are likely to shape the rest of their lives. We know this, whether it's their attainment at school and their future job prospects, whether it's their long-term health outcomes. Uh, our early years school readiness review wanted to take a look at how we could best support parents and professionals to provide children with the best possible start. Um, the review was initiated actually following feedback from schools that in line with national trends, increasing numbers of Sheffield children were starting school at a position of disadvantage. The review heard that children were arriving with unidentified and unmet needs, ranging from significant send issues to a lack of basic self-care skills that might be expected of that age group. Um, getting a good start in life and throughout childhood, building that resilience and getting maximum benefit from education are really important markers for good health and well-being throughout life. Um, and we need to ensure that every Sheffield child has the best start in life and they're ready to learn it to and ready for school at five. Um, the review sought to act upon the real strengths that we have in Sheffield around early years. The partnerships within early years, that's our Nought to 19 teams, our early years providers, our uh, council teams work together really well in the spirit of partnership. And the intention was to build on that. And um, essentially what we wanted to do was collectively improve outcomes. We wanted to clarify what outcomes we needed to have to uh, improve school readiness in the city, agree what needs to change in supporting school readiness, develop and describe what innovative practice we already have and what we need going forward, um, and to really identify short and long-term benefits of achieving our identified <coughs> goals and raise the profile of early years in the city. Um, it is an important time frame for young children uh, and we, we're on quite a mission at the moment to, to raise that profile right across the system. So uh, we, read, we led the review in early years and early health commissioning. Um, we included parents and partners within that. And we kept that stakeholder involvement going forward into lots of activity um, that we developed from the findings. Many of the issues that were raised in review have already been addressed through our work stream activity. Uh, we really wanted to, to put some momentum behind this and move it forward. Uh, some of the developments that have uh, appeared from this really are a new perinatal mental health pathways under development, our special educational needs coordinated training for private providers um, has been undertaken at level three and level four with the ambition that all our private providers have a qualified SENCO in place. That's been funded jointly by STC and DFE. We have an ongoing speech and language review and a developmental language disorder review that are in progress. In fact, the developmental language disorder one's just finished. Lots of findings in there that are gonna support outcomes going forward. Um, we have the Save the Children Work in Locality B, which is all about home school learning environments which is a massive uh, area for development in the city. Um, and we're looking at the next rollout of that across the city, how we can work, uh, do that well. Um, we've got two DFE funded family hub research projects going on. Uh, there's not money attached to that, but it's about getting those research uh, teams involved in that. That's a really exciting prospect. We are involved in South Yorkshire Futures partnership work in conjunction with the University of Sheffield, and we've developed some that speech and language resources from that. Um, and of course, we have our family hubs development that's come uh, into the city and the family centres uh, start for life offer that's developed. Um, we've been doing an awful lot of training around brain architecture and trauma informed practice in early years. Um, we aim to undertake what we do of early years and funding 
and um, develop more of a focus on transitions. Um, and that's really been highlighted more so by the accelerated progress plan. There are some system infrastructure and investment recommendations uh, that we'd like to bring to your attention. Um, essentially, we'd like to develop a leadership role for early years. What our providers and partners tell us is that the way that early years are spread across various departments within the council um, works. Well, we all do work together incredibly well, but actually it's about having a lead, a director with that leadership responsibility for early years. Um, we'd like to see some impre increased investment in portage, and I know that Tim's teams are already looking at that. Um, increased investment into early years prevention services and early years centre support is, is vital. We are going to get some of our family hubs money is helping us with that. We're developing some uh, community support workers for early years and looking at the prevention teams to see what we can add in. Um, the early years centre support needs some integration into a wider early years system and that's just something that we need to look at going forward. Uh, and we really do need to develop the parental voice and influence in this space. Um, and we've got some opportunities with the Family Hubs development to make that happen, get parents involved on governance groups, um, etc. So there are some local and national factors that we would really like some Sheffield leadership voice and influence in. Um, the, the retention and recruitment of early years settings workers is, is really difficult at the moment. There is a real struggle there. We have supported some recruitment fairs at um, Sheffield College, um, but actually voice is needed in that area. Settings are closing nationally, and it is a problem in Sheffield too. Um, the national two-year-old funded early learning criteria is excluding children who would benefit, essentially working poor families. Um, and yet we do have some low take-up in some pockets of the city for that. Toddler groups were um, obviously closed during COVID and reopening of those toddler groups is slow. We need to invest some time and some support into our voluntary sector to re-establish those uh, toddler groups. Those toddler groups are often the first point of contact for families, they reduce isolation, they're places where people go for advice and support. They really are front line, and we need to look at what we can do to support their recovery. Um, focused exploration really around the issues of early identification of SEND uh, amongst children from minority ethnic communities and the links to high exclusion rates is something that we really need to explore in the city. We, do, we have found through this review that essentially the two key factors that are uh, make impacting on school readiness for our children or unidentified SEND needs and living in areas of deprivation, with SEND needs being the higher of those factors. And we do need to, to look at the support to improve educational outcomes for Roma children. We've got some good practice in place and we need to look at that in the early years space much more. So essentially, um, the by taking forward the recommendations in this review, there are some potential for long-term savings in health and education. For example, targeted parenting support, which we do well in this city, um, to prevent conduct disorders, so behaviour, etc., pays back eight pounds over six years for every pound invested. So although we know the financial situation that we're in in Sheffield, and very aware of national uh, situation around that, we do need to look at our investment in early years in terms of the savings over a longer period of time. Uh, so we are, by, by taking forward these recommendations, we're contributing to the ambitions and priorities around physical and mental health in the city, education and economic well-being, and um, within the corporate plan, the inclusion strategy, um, Sheffield's Great Starting Line strategy, etc. We've done an awful lot of consultation. We've consulted with um, professional groups, that health visitors, nursery nurses, providers, early years teams. We've also done a huge amount of consultation with, parenting, uh, with parents, and uh, we've 
done online surveys, etc. We've used every way possible to make sure that we've got uh, everybody's views. So the key findings, essentially, communication and collaboration at key points of transition need to be improved. Uh, SEM-related issues have formed the majority of the concerns. Speech, language and communication is an indicator and a focus for early years activity. There is variation amongst professionals in their understanding of their contribution to school readiness, particularly in the maternity, I would say. Um, there's a need to raise awareness in the city of the social and economic impact in terms of a child's whole life course, in terms of vulnerability, and in terms of seldom heard groups and the impact of that. We've got lots of good quality activity in, the Sheff in Sheffield, and we need to be as connected as possible to make the most of the, uh, the funding and the opportunities and the resources that we have. <coughs> uh, information sharing is an ongoing concern, and we are doing a quite big piece of work in that, that area within commissioning at the moment, which should make a lot of difference. Um, and on, across the system, we need to consider activity and input much earlier in, in the child's journey. Uh, parents have told us that they have difficulty getting professionals to listen to their concerns. And we've heard from parents that children are, are not being accepted into nursery places because settings don't feel they're able to accommodate their needs. We need to clarify our pathways for support for families and we need to, to, to improve our offer to non-breastfeeding mums. And, we, and parents have told us that they want more opportunities to co-produce the plans and the activity that we put forward. Um, we have done an equality impact assessment. Um, we um, actually recognise that the two contributors to factors within that are that um, in order for children to reach their early learning goals, SEND is, that, is the significant uh, impact along with deprivation, as I said earlier. And we do have uh, an issue, especially around boys, in terms of good levels of development within our Roma communities. So I think that's me. Thank you, Marie. Do you want a drink? You sound a little bit dry mouth. A drink. We can, so I'll get somebody to go and fetch you on because you sound as though you, you, you could do uh, gin and tonic. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that. Uh, you, you're going to get one anyway because uh, Joel's gone outside. Dude. Right. Um, questions. Dawn first. Thank you, Chair. I do believe. The comments I'm going to make means that I need to declare an interest as this is an early years uh, paper and I work for an organisation that run a community nursery um, that is currently at risk, I think. As are, and the only reason I'm saying that is because I had the pleasure of coming and opening your early years event to look at the strategy moving forward and I was approached by 12 community nurseries that day who were all at risk of closure uh, due to the national funding um, strategy or lack of funding for early years. I'm a massive advocate for early years. I come from a short start background where I started 20 years ago um, and I do really um, worry about the lack of investment in early years. I think whilst we are looking at partnership working, I believe that that will also be at risk if our private and voluntary sector nurseries and early years providers are no longer there as they are a pathway in and are often based in our most uh, economically disadvantaged communities as well. So I do really worry about that. Having um, spoken to a lot of parents recently about their concerns around early years, there are a number of things for me. Mm -hmm. Whilst we will be working on recruitment, the retention, I believe, is the issue because of the low pay uh, for early years workers, the fact that they are undervalued, the amount of work that they do. People just think they play with Lego and crayons. And actually, having been in an early years setting, that is where we set our foundations for our future generations. Um, so I just want to thank everybody working in early years for that. But there are a couple of things. One is speech and language. I understand that coming out of back of COVID, 
We've got a 10% increase in children coming into early year settings with delayed speech and language. And I'm just wondering how this strategy will help us to uh, overcome that, knowing that we've always struggled uh, to, to recruit uh, into speech and language as well. That's been a battle that we've been fighting for a while. Um, and also, um, just I'd just like to know a little bit more about your recommendation about having a director for early years and what, how that will improve things and what impact that would have, not just on our partnerships within the local authority, the council itself across the, the different areas, but how that will improve things for the sector uh, in general, please. Could I just piggyback a question on, on, on the back of that? It's, you know, we're in the middle of, or about to start a governance review. And I'm just wondering whether or not officers are being asked to contribute to that. And it's on the back of the idea of having a director and the spread of early years across a number of different um, service areas. Because I've made that point about if the spread, and I'm just wondering if you as officers are being encouraged to participate in this governance review. Try to answer all of those questions. Um, I think that where we are uh, as a as a group of, of early years um, work is very concerned about voluntary sector at the moment, and I think one of the um, ways that we're going to try to support that is through our Urban Family Hubs development. Um, there is a lot of focus within that um, around community support and we've put our community support workers in place in early years to really start to support uh, community resilience and develop volunteering and support the existing voluntary sector through our early health partnership training etc we're really conscious that we need to um, invest as much time and resource as possible into helping our community organizations to continue I think the issue of setting closures is absolutely huge for us all and I would um, request if we can do anything as a, as a group to um, protest in any way and to make voices known, that would be incredibly useful. Uh, in terms of speech language, the speech and language review that's going on at the moment is looking at all aspects of speech and language, they're right from um, that early intervention and prevention element up to specialist and targeted support. We are particularly interested in, again, getting that early help out into the community, so taking the work where the families are. I'm not expecting everyone to wait for a referral to speech and language and then come into town for that support. It's about saying that we get... Um, we get some speech and language activity within communities, play and say groups, etc., and that we encourage our toddler groups to do that early identification. So a lot of what we're doing at the moment is around that earliest identification and prevention. As you say, post-COVID, we've got lots of isolated families. We've got children who've not had that experience. Uh, so as much as possible, it's about creating those experiences. I think Joe wants to add something. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you, Marie. And uh, it's really just on the question of governance and the role of, um, you know, my teams um, in the review of the governance. Um, just to reassure that, you know, we have quite a lot of interest in the review of the governance because there are a number of areas, early years being one of them, and transitions, which we've talked about, uh, transitions at all ages actually um, being another. So um, we have a, a number of, of, um, of areas that we have particular interest in examples in. So yes, um, I did get some information on the review um, just uh, earlier this week on returning from leave. So I'll make sure that we are as officers, you know, getting our, getting our say in that process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and just on John's last question around, I, I know it's about having a director that is just for early years, it's about having an existing director with a responsibility for early years, which is quite, you know, difficult. We are spread across a number of sectors. 
I think it's also about the identity of early years in Sheffield. And as I said earlier, what we're about is raising the profile. We're about to move in to a new early years strategy. Uh, great start in life is come to a cl will come to a close in March. We've achieved an awful lot, but we're really conscious that these are the children of the future. And what we need essentially is a figurehead for that, for the city. Uh, somebody to champion for us nationally, for a face for people to go to and know that that person has that commitment to early years. Um, I think it's about recognising the importance of early years. Heather, Colin. <laughs> um, thank you. This, is, this isn't a, a new problem, I mean, it's been going on a while because I remember as the member responsible, it must have been 11 years ago, sitting in with practitioners and talking about the language acquisition, actually, and just simple things. We did an exercise, and, and it was all about um, children being left with dummies in their mouths too long, so they couldn't, you know, didn't, didn't articulate and things like that. And there were very simple things to be passed on. I visited the school where in the reception class of 60, 58 were below the chronological age in development. And I realised you know, that COVID may well have, have held it back a bit more, so we need to, to refresh this. But it, it's so important because, as you outlined in your presentation, it impacts right throughout the schooling. If you're playing catch-up from day one in reception, you, you've got that lag all the way through, perhaps all the way through to you know, GCSEs and, and um, A-levels and so on. Um, and it, it isn't even across the city and it's related to the factors that you've, you've worked out. I mean, on thinking about more positively how we can address it, and I, I'm conscious and a bit alarmed by Dawn's comment about the, the uh, fragility of the, the sector. One of the most vibrant uh, mornings in our local libraries, Wednesday morning, when there's, a, I was going to say, um, parents and toddlers, but it's sometimes grandparents and toddlers uh, group going on, and the activities going on and engaging there, sort of, it's, and it's volunteers run, running that. And I, I'm sure that the people at Totley Library may well be willing to share their best practice because they're doing this uh, uh, job at the other volunteer or, or community run run libraries or settings to try and um, not you know, replace or anything, but actually add to the, to the mix of, of where parents can go with the children, the children can mix, socialize, and, and you know, in, in doing lots of activities, pick up the skills necessary to be more school ready when, when they, they come. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, We've got to keep up this, and I suspect that over time, initiatives of a decade ago drift downwards, and they've got to be, you know, boosted back up again. And I get the idea of the director responsible. This is is almost to knit the various strands together, so that you've got a one go-to person instead of wondering which director where and, and and you know how to how to do this. And this person. It's got a tall order, but you know it will to invigorate and try and ensure that all the young people across the city have got opportunities preschool in in order to you know um, try and uh, arrive at, sc at school ready, rather than actually the reception and year one, year two just being playing catch up, which is happening in far too many cases. I think those were more comments than questions, but I don't know whether you want to respond to it in any way, but don't feel you have to. Well, thank you. That, that was really supportive and, and absolutely echoed our own thoughts around, you know, we need to reboot a lot of our community activity post-COVID. We've had a, a lot, there's a lot of good practice beforehand, and we need to find that, re, reinvigorate that. We've been working with our People Keeping Well partners to get some volunteering in place uh, to help to support toddler groups coming back. Um, and, um, an awful lot of activity going on, but we're always keen to see good practice and share good practice. Peter. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Marie. 
I'm, I'm very conscious that um, money spent in early years um, is well spent. Um, and it's well spent from the individual's point of view because their lives are that much more productive and um, happy, hopefully. Um, but it's also um, very much f for the, the council itself because um, money spent in earlier years prevents money having to be spent um, on uh, extra classes or they may have, as you mentioned, send uh, uh, implications there as well. So in a way it is um, putting money into this area um, becomes a bit like investor save, um, but really, really difficult to work out what you're saving. Um, so I, I, I'm not quite sure how we go about um, making that calculation, but I'll come back to the first point that it's really for the benefit of the young people themselves um, uh, and, and for their future lives. Um, the other point I wanted to make, um, have you identified any particular groups, any ethnic groups or any other sorts of groups um, where there are these problems uh, of um, uh, you know, get, getting speech uh, up, up, to, up to the level? Um, are there any issues with those and have you seen any solutions uh, around that? Because uh, it occurs to me that you say there are areas in the city where you know, pockets where, where it's really bad. Um, are there any, um, any other factors uh, that, that we need to take into account when, when looking at this? The main factors that are affecting children uh, in terms of school readiness are uh, is spent. Uh, and within that, obviously, there was speech, language, and communication, uh, physical needs. Um, learning disability, etc. Um, but actually, that compounded with, it, with, with living in an area of deprivation puts our children at significant disadvantage. And the key for, for that, really, is to make sure that we're identifying as early as possible. Um, in terms of the ethnicity, we, we don't see uh, a strong difference in the various ethnic groups in Sheffield, apart from our Chinese population, children do much better. Generally speaking, um, it is more dependent on your SEND needs and where you live. That books the trend nationally, to be fair, but that's where we are. Okay, Pete. Brian. Yeah, uh, two questions. Um, I'm sorry. No, that's my fault. Sorry, Joe. It's okay. It's just a very quick one on the um, on the invest to save point that you make. Because I think that's a really important point, and you know we're working really closely with the NHS um, in Sheffield and across South Yorkshire um, as part of the sort of integration agenda um, under the Health and Care Act. Um, and actually that early intervention um, discussion is a really key part of our of our work with the NHS so you know what are their interventions what are our interventions how could we be more efficient quicker or quicker off the mark more effective to achieve better outcomes I'm not necessarily talking about you know huge cash savings from that but actually better outcomes so how do we leverage you know, health and care and education all together um, for the best effect, really. Um, and so that's, I just wanted to kind of uh, flag that to the committee that that's a, an area where we are spending quite a lot of time discussing that with health and hopefully we will see, you know, some new opportunities really to drive better outcomes. There are a couple of examples of that. The early years, uh, the speech and language review is multi-agency, and that's that is essentially looking as Joe has said. And there were we have a new road disability program that we're doing that same, taking that same approach in. So it's it's pooling resources uh, for better outcomes. Yeah, can I just add in to there that the criminal justice system would benefit as well from uh, having having this early investment. Uh, a lot of the people who are in prison at the moment are suffering from uh, a low educational standards uh, 
probably starting way, you know, when they were one or two years old. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that, Brian. Off you go. So I'll, I'll do the questions separately, so I can answer one of them, one of them first because they're, they're different. Uh, so, of course, like a number of us have also heard that parents say that they're not being listened to. So having established a, a kind of, uh, as you mentioned here, stakeholder involvement, is there a place to continue that stakeholder involvement as, as, a, as a group so you can keep up those links? So is that is that going to be part of the, the, the strategy going forward? Yes, so we're, we're about to, well, we have just launched through the early years event our uh, consultation for the new early year strategy. And obviously we will be talking to lots of parents within that. But one of the areas that we have already identified as a priority within the new strategy is parental engagement. Um, a key principle of the new family hubs models is around uh, fam families' voice and influence. And they are currently setting up their governance structures to make sure that they have parent representatives on each of their, the levels of governance within that. Um, we do an awful lot through um, family, family centres already, uh, but there's definitely much further to go. But yeah, keeping up that momentum of, of family engagement and parental voice is really important. Thank, thank you. And this probably isn't for you to answer, Marie, but I, but I notice that there is no, I'm at the right piece, so there's been no climate impact assessment on, on this piece of work. Um, in my opinion, for anything to do with buildings and land, there is a climate emergency implication. Um, and with the family hubs uh, and family hub funding, the Start for Life offer, family centres being established, there are implications there. So that is not being, doesn't seem to have been picked up. Okay, that's, that's fair comment, take that away. Andrew wants to add uh, something to the response. Sorry, not to that one. He, he was on a different point. On just no. in particular, just it, we, we've talked about a director of early years. I want to be really clear. One, it's not in the paper, so we're not formally proposing that today. There are two bits really. One is I think the governance review that you've mentioned, Chair, to make sure that actually, in terms of the oversight of early years, is is better brought together. And then secondly, as officers, for us to review how um, early years activity in the council is structured and then to come back to the committee with some proposals um, around that. It's just other people in the building might um, have kittens that have thought we've just invented a new director post. So I just want to be really clear, we weren't proposing that, but I do think there should be a single focal, uh, a single focal point for that. Is it on this, though? Just on this, it, it is the recommendation is to develop the development of a leadership role for Sheffield Early Years is in the paper. Yeah, so just, sorry, just to be clear, I'm not saying we shouldn't have a single focal point because I do think we should. I think it's 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 really missing that. But it's just that the, in the vernacular entered the phrase the director of Early Years, and I think we just need to be clear that's not what we're saying. We we want to have a single officer who can lead on this for the council. Okay, fair enough, Andrew. And I'll just hand myself out then. Um, I think it's clear that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet here, that we realise that it's really, really important to get early years right, because if not, then there's huge repercussions as children move on the school system uh, and, and young people. Um, I think um, toddler groups are really, really important, and, and I actually run a toddler group in my area, uh, it's really, really well attended, um, and it's quite often children's first step into something, mixing with other children, um, parents getting together, quite a lot of issues are solved at toddler groups, um, quite a lot of information sharing, and a lot of really, really good interaction between a parent and grandparent and their child. Um, and, and so it, it's really, it, it's all good. So I think we should be looking at trying to support those groups 
and a lot of groups did not go, come back after COVID. In my ward in particular, I can think of several um, toddler groups that did not reopen. Um, whether the reason was that the people who ran them had lost interest, I don't really know, but, but it's certainly something that we should be, be looking at. Um, I think in terms of family hubs or family centres, that, that's brilliant. In my area, we actually have a family, well, it calls it a family centre. Um, it was one of the original Shore Start centres and it was purpose built and it was amazing. It was, it was really brilliant. Uh, some excellent things going on there. And then it became a link centre and now there's virtually nothing happens there. So people living in my ward then have to travel possibly two buses and we're in an area that buses just are non-existent. Um, so, so parents don't tend from my area to go to this, this centre, uh, which is a great shame. So I think we, we do need to be, you know, looking at how we can improve that situation. And I think, you know, vol the voluntary sector is really a good, uh, is a good way forward. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I think we've taken on board what you said about um, we have much, we have yeah, a much more reduced number of centres now. Actually, what we need to do with the family hubs work is to is not, you know, take that work out. So satellite activity, not centre-based activity, and that's a real push in this, along with um, that support to restart toddler groups, encourage voluntary sector involvement. Just come back on. Uh, also, you're talking about parental involvement, and I think in the early years, it's really, really important um, to establish that because once children get to secondary school age that parental involvement is extremely difficult. So I think it, it's really important at this sort of early years age. Yeah. Is there anyone else? Uh, I've just got a, a couple of observations. Um, I think as a committee, we need to have a, a, what Dawn would probably describe as a deep dive into this particular area. So I'm just asking that uh, if Andrew could um, organize that so that we've got um, a better oversight and a, perhaps a more detailed understanding of, of, of what we're talking about. Um, there's no doubt that, you know, having the idea that the, a focal point, an officer who is, in con is responsible for that area, it would be beneficial. How, you, how we arrange that is up for discussion, but the principle is a good one. And, um, the family hub situation, I mean, I've had a, an email recently from Lorraine Wood, I think, uh, I, but I don't know how many other people have seen that email, uh, and I think it might be a good idea if all councillors were sent that, because it's, a, it's, it's something that affects everybody, and it's another subject that I think eventually ought to come to this uh, committee uh, and via our uh, group of, of uh, com um, sort of uh, discussion um, sessions. So I think that might be worthwhile sending out. Um, and finally, the last comment is a lot of this, you're not going to get any disagreement, I don't think, on the recommendations. But I just find it very frustrating that I remember the words of a former prime minister there's no such thing as a money tree well they found one when they needed one and i think now they might they should go looking for another money tree from somewhere but uh, that's just me being bitter and twisted um right so if there's nothing else from anybody else uh can we agree the recommendations as per the report any dissent no thank you very much and i've let that go on for a while deliberately because I thought it was a subject that deserved it. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, elective home education. Is that, who's doing that? Is it you, Tim? Uh, this is for information only, Tim. In. Yeah, 
so you've, um, you asked for a um, report back to the committee in terms of current position on elective home education. Elective home education, just as a reminder, being where parents have chosen to um, provide the education for their child otherwise than at school, in line with legislation, so that's under the Children's Act, that a parent has a responsibility to ensure that their child receives a... Um, uh, efficient educate full-time education that's suitable to their age aptitude and ability and any special educational needs uh, either at school or otherwise you've got a report there with all of the key points in from last year um, in terms of detailing what our current situation is um, I'll give you just the key, the very key highlight things which is essentially we're around about 500 children young people that we know of in the city who are home educated there is no requirement for a parent to ensure that they notify us um, at birth that they are in, uh, at birth, uh, rather than going into school that they intend to home educate. Um, uh, there is no current legal requirement for the local authority to maintain a register, but obviously we do maintain a register of those children that we're aware of and any children that are identified in our duties to identify as far as possible children who may not be receiving um, a suitable education. Um, and currently we have about 500 children and young people um, that we know of. Um, critically, you'll see in the report that needs are not about parents choosing a different philosophy of education primarily. What we know is that the majority of parents who we're aware of who home educate the needs of their children is around stress and phobias, uh, anxiety, dissatisfaction with schools, um, their needs not being met, or them not having a school place that they want um, in place. Um, what you'll also see is that we have a responsibility around establishing any suitability um, and currently the numbers roughly split a third, a third, a third. So a third of children we know uh, from the information that we've got are receiving a suitable education. A third we are of the view that they're not currently and are working to with those families where possible through supportive measures and if necessary through legal measures to address that. And a third where we don't have a current assessment because we're either waiting for them to provide that information for the first time or we've asked that for our annual update and, and that information is not yet through or not yet being assessed. You'll also see that there's a growing increase in needs um, of those young people in terms of uh, special educational needs in particular, um, but the broader needs that those families present with. Um, ultimately, the, um, the legislation is quite clear about the role of the local authority to um, identify children who may not be receiving a suitable education. Um, it is quite a challenging piece of work to sit within because there, there's no national definition of suitable education. There's no requirement for a parent, for example, to have a structured timetable. We have parents who successfully home educate their children through unstructured approaches, through very flexible learning, very different approaches to learning. Um, and so it's not a nice tick sheet in terms of suitability, and so we do have to work closely with them. You'll also see from the report that staffing in this space is a lead teacher to um, uh, uh, assessors and uh, support staff in terms of working with parents on the education that they have in place and a family intervention worker as well as business support into that space. I'll stop there because you've had the paper and an opportunity to read it. The last thing I will say is that there is a question mark for us which we're asking government about in terms of the new data collection and the new expectation around a children not in school register, which is a proposal in current legislation going through. Obviously, there's some current delays on that legislation with changes um, in Westminster. Um, but one of the things that we're looking at clarity on is when a child is classed as child missing education and when they're classed as elective home education, um, uh, uh, but we believe they're unsuitable. So that may cause some interesting dynamics for us in the future. But our commitment is to continue to work with families to try and say, how do we make sure that your child is receiving a suitable education um, where families are doing it well, support them, equip them um, it, within the means that we have available, where they're not, work with them to try and address the barriers. Thanks, Tim. Dawn, and then Colin, and then Peter. Thank you, Chair. Just on the, um, the situation around the, the children's reasons for being home educated and... Um, 
the level of support. I'm trying to get a, a grip of the level of support that a family might receive. So you and I have had conversations, Tim. I've probably got about four or five families who have currently made a decision to home educate their children because of school placement being almost seven miles away and I'm having to get three buses. Um, what support do those parents get from the local authority with regards to ensuring that their children are gaining some level of um, appropriate education for their, for their needs? And also, what do we do about families who say they are home educating? How do we, how do we assess whether or not a family is home educating or just not sending their children to school because of anxiety? Ooh, hit the right button. Um, I'll try and answer those as swiftly as I can. Um, what support do they get? So I do need to reiterate the point that where a parent chooses home education, they are fully responsible for that child's education, all the support, all the financial resources, all the things in place. They take on that massive responsibility that our schools generally have for most of the children and young people in our city. And we do often get parents going, well, where's my tutor? I've come out of school. Where's, where's all of this? There is not a package of intervention, of uh, uh, provision. There is not teachers are not going to come out and plan their learning for them because that's not the local authority's duty in that, but also we don't have the resource to do it. The parents have chosen to take on that educational responsibility. What we do is offer advice and guidance. We sign posts to um, uh, different useful websites, different resources, different approaches, different local groups. We, uh, for those parents where there's a good ongoing, where there's that dynamic in terms of they've asked for it, we have access to things like the library and a couple of other things that we make available and fund for that. But ultimately, the support is to say, what is the education you are choosing to put in place? Here is different routes that you can do that. Now we need you to be able to, understand. we need to be assured that your child is receiving an efficient, full-time, suitable education in line with their needs. So. The support is conversational. We will do home visits. We will invite parents in. Um, uh, we'll do it over the phone. We'll do it via email. We'll do it all sorts of different routes to try and work with families and say, what does it look like? But we won't and aren't going to go and aren't equipped to be able to go every week and say, right, what's your planning for your education this week? Our job is to talk to parents about how they are structuring their responsibilities in terms of education. Um, uh, Apologies, I didn't get to fully right in the second question. It's just, what do we do when we've got parents that have opted to or been shoved to home educate their children because of issues within school? How do we, how do we um, ensure that those children are, again, getting the right, right education? And just on the, the last answer that you just gave me, if we are not satisfied as a local authority that those children are getting an adequate education, what do we do about it? So, um, in terms of how, where a parent feels that they, and, and I regularly get parents saying, I have no choice but to home educate. I, I appreciate that that's how a parent may feel, but in every case, I would also note, under my service, I have the admissions team, and every child in the city is offered a school place. And if there's appropriate transport stuff, they have a route to access that. I appreciate that doesn't always feel easy or right um, in terms of distance, but based on the policies that are agreed, every child does have access to it. So if, if a family feels that they can't home educate or we've got worries about that, our family intervention worker will work with them about what and how we get them back into school, if we can do, um, why they've come out of school in the first place, what they're expecting to achieve. And we have a lot, and you'll see from the data, a lot of families who come for a very short period of time to home educate and actually see that the grass isn't greener and it's not going to be all provided for them and all done for them, so we sort them back in. Um, if we're not satisfied, we will try to work with the family in terms of saying, what does it need to look like? But that will be about, here's how you can do it, now you need to go and do it, we won't do it for them. Ultimately, we have a legal recourse through a school attendance order where we will name a, child, a school place for a child and we've done a lot of work around that. And if the parent still doesn't send their child to school, um, they can be taken into court for, for breach, and we are progressing that route. We don't want to go down the legal route, but sometimes that's the only route available for us, because ultimately the child is not um, getting the education that the parent has a legal duty to fulfill, and we have a legal duty to identify. <clears throat> yeah, actually my question is on similar 
theme to, to Dawn's about the quality assurance, and so you've, you've answered that. <clears throat> but just from your last answer, it seems that, well, I suspect in a lot of cases we don't really know whether the child's getting a suitable education or not, because the 503 members of staff or whatever, it's not possible to visit all of them. And if you ask the parents, they're likely to give you a positive answer, just you know, and give them the check. But where we do know that the child isn't getting a suitable education, I take it from your last answer, there is a, a legal sort of steps to go through and we can sort of almost force them back into school and, and, and so on. Um, it gives me some reassurance, but I'm still a bit concerned about the many children that we don't really know whether they're getting a, a good education or not. And the other thing is, it's my recollection that may not be correct, but I recollect that Bannerdale, when it existed, there were some resources um, that could be borrowed by parents for home education, sort of texts and various things like that. Does that central resource no longer exist? So on the resource, we offer parents access to library services. Um, so that's where some of those resources come. I don't know what used to happen at Bannerdale to be able to say it does or doesn't, but we, we have access to that and some online things that parents can access. So we do work with parents with what resource we do have in terms of that. Just on the quality assurance, I think one of the things I would note is that in the national guidance, it states quite clearly that there is no assumption that there's not a suitable provision in place. So the starting point isn't an assumption that it's not suitable. The starting point is that parents are seeking to ensure it's suitable. We are trying to reassure ourselves that it's suitable. And the reason why I raise that is because it creates that dynamic in terms of we're not going in saying we're expecting this not to be suitable, so prove it and prove that it's suitable. Our duties under the national guidance is to go and work with families and say, how are we assured that actually you are doing what you're supposed to do? I think the, the challenge with quality assurance is exactly what you're saying. How We're not there every day, you know, um, and likewise, we're not Ofsted inspectors, and we shouldn't be going in as Ofsted inspectors to a parent's school. And parents can deliver their education in vastly different ways. But the team are skilled and experienced at working through with parents in terms of what does it look like and what are they presenting to us. Critically, we're looking at how we audit those responses so that we've got consistency in terms of what parents tell us. So those key points about is there evidence that the education is received, i.e., do we know that the child's in, engaging with them? It, do we know it's effective, i.e., is it having impact? And I think that's really challenging to put, put, put in place. Is it full-time? We can talk about hours, but actually, really, it comes down to is where does the education look at and is the education suitable to their age, aptitude, ability, and special educational needs? You're not going to teach a child in, in, who's five um, quadratic equations, so is it appropriate? Likewise, a 16-year-old shouldn't be reading unless they've got a very clear additional need. Biff and Chip type books at, uh, at, at first reading levels in terms of stuff, but parents job in this space is to understand their child's learning needs, be clear about what they want to achieve, and then work with it. Our job is to say, right, tell us how you're doing those things and where we've got concerns, escalate that with them and say, tell us a bit more. That does sometimes cause us problems because parents go, actually, you're stepping out of what we believe is your legal duty. Leave us alone. Peter. Thanks. I think my concerns are around similar areas that Dawn and Colin have got. Um, you said right at the beginning that um, the cohort is about 500 that we know of. So is there any idea about um, how many that you don't know of? I mean, it's obvious. You know, do you want know to I mean? That statistically, there may be a, a way of working out approximately how many um, children aren't attending school and who may be receiving elective home education. And um, so we're in the realms of Donald Rumsfeld here, aren't we? We don't know what we know, but maybe we do know um, something. Absolutely, we don't know what we don't know. Um, uh, we don't have a route, because children come up through known routes through education and various other things, um, because data sharing is as it is in terms of knowledge and, and those sorts of questions. We are raising 
Um, one of the questions I'm looking at with my children missing education team is how do we know about children that we don't know about? What does it need to look like in terms of that proactive identification? Because a lot of the time we're reactive in terms of a child becomes known to us, we then do something about it. But we know that there are children in our city who are not recorded on our numbers because the parent has never made themselves known as a home educator or made themselves known into the education system and for whatever reason, rightly, you know, they've, they've not become known to any of our other services. There's a question for me in terms of how we work with our GPs in terms of that, but likewise, a GP's job is not to speak to a parent and say, right, why well, are you on school or you're not on school? Right, I'm going to report you to somebody because they don't have that, you know, we're back to confidentiality and stuff. So we're, in, we're very much in that, the known unknowns. The intent of the government currently under the white paper is to have a children not in school register and the guidance that's currently going through and we'll, we'll see what lands in terms of legislation basically says that there's a duty on local authorities, a duty on parents and a duty on providers. Um, but what it doesn't say is what happens if the parent doesn't observe that duty. So uh, does a duty suddenly mean that parents can go, I must ring up Tim Armstrong and let him know them home educating. And I don't know whether it will or not. I think finally, John. Oh, uh, sorry, I've got another question as well. No, okay. Um, you, you mentioned you do occasionally take legal means to try and um, settle the matter, shall we say. How often does that happen and, and, and are the costs particularly high or low or what are they? I haven't got the costs to hand. One of the questions I'm asking our legal colleagues at the moment is the costs. Um, we're also looking at what happens when we take a parent to court and they're fined because the current school attendance order process is basically you put an order in place and that's fairly easy to do. It's not high costs in terms of that. Um, you then if they're in breach of it, i.e. they don't register their child at the school and send their, uh, in terms of sending their child, you can take them to court for breach of that, which is essentially a fine. doesn't then mean that the child's then going to go to school because the parent might pay the fine and still ignore the, those things. So we have got a growing number of them and we're trying to look at the impact of that. So some families are going back in terms of those things. Where parents accept that the education they're providing is not suitable, they're more... They're more we don't need to go down the school attendance order route in the same way um, because they want a school place. Where the difficulty comes with that is where they say, but I want a school place there and we can't offer it. Finally, Dawn. Thank you. I think this just brings us back, this topic, to the early years. Back in the day, 20 years ago, when you were at Show Start programme, all children were registered and you would have registered, you would have had contact with Jessup's Hospital, midwives and health visitors. Most parents, even if they decide to home educate, access toddler groups and early years provision that's not registered, even in communities. So you wouldn't have lost them on way. You, they would have, they have a choice to home educate or to put into a mainstream uh, education provision, but somebody somewhere would have still had a connection with that family um, and then would, we would know that they'd chosen to home educate. So just kind of explaining again the importance of the early years and engagement with the parents would help us probably to overcome some of that not knowing where the children are. Um, potentially yes. What I would say is there's never been a national register and there's always been home educated children not known to the LA even with those systems but it comes down to what's the data sharing protocols that needs to be clear between stuff because I guarantee a number of home educated families have been involved in play groups and other things but it's that data sharing and data requirement and I suspect the children not in school register may help us with that in the future but we have to wait and see. Right. Uh, thank you Tim. There's no specific recommendation is there so it's just basically to note the report I think. Um, I just want one comment really. I, I've looked at this from a school group board point of view and a, now a policy committee point of view uh, and it's opened my eyes. Um, all I would ask is that in the future if you feel the need to come back to us uh, because of whatever reason then just give us a nod and we'll have another look at it again I think because it's it's a very emotive and very um, almost hidden problem I think in some respects but thank you for your contribution um, I am aware that people are drifting I know Councillor Ross has got to go very shortly um, uh, who, who would be doing item 14
Sally, would you be would you be enormously insulted if I was just to say that we could take this as read unless there are specific questions on it from members? I have some plans actually to do this every week. Okay. Yes. It's just I'm trying to get to so that we, there's not only just me in here. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> are we are we happy to do that? Yeah. Just note and thank yeah. the report. Yeah. yeah. There you go, Sally. Thank you very much. Uh, next is what? What's next? Somebody tell me what's next. Is it Victoria? It's you. Round two. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of this agenda item, it is to note that both the executive summaries are the Competition and Market Authority's report into children's social care and also the Independent Care Review of Children's Social Care, commonly known as the Josh McAllister Review that was published in May 22. Uh, it was discussed at the Corporate Parenting Board in September with a specific emphasis on placement sufficiency and looked after children both nationally and locally and some of the um, uh, areas arising from both of those reviews. So um, I, I think it's for the committee to note um, that that was discussed at those that meeting. Probably well, my surprise. Yeah. Anybody got anything that they want to ask, comment, say, whatever on this? Because we have seen it at least once, I think, haven't we? Before. Anybody? Just, just uh, thank you for presenting it. Yeah, we, we read it and we've had in-depth discussion about this and the, the market. Um, um, in, in there that you were present at, and I think all, all our relevant comments have probably been made at that those meetings. Well, that's true. Maybe we need another money tree, and hope maybe somebody will break, will mend the broken system. There's a lot of them around at the moment, isn't there? Right. Thank you, Victoria. Many uh, thanks, Chair. The last item is two lots of uh, minutes. Both, I think, emergency or whatever they call urgency subcommittees, I believe. Uh, can we uh, agree that they're correct records and etc.? Uh, and I think that's about it for this morning. Thank you very much. Councillor Ross is smiling at me, which makes me very <laughs> worried. <laughs> uh, you, you owe me one. Um, thanks very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day.